Greetings everyone, I'm Russ Still with Gold Seal and thanks for joining us here on this Thursday afternoon. Uh, with all this COVID stuff going on, I know it's really impacted a lot of people and they're flying. So I hope that you have had the chance to get out there and indulge some and uh, try to keep your head in the game with some aviation. We've been doing some frequent private sessions for our ground school members and one that we did, oh, a couple of weeks ago was on cross-country flight planning. And that turned out to be one of the more popular ones that we've done. So we decided to bring back uh, our uh, expert guest and revisit this one because I think it's something that a lot of people really enjoy and maybe learn a few things about. Now, this is not going to be how to fill out a nav log or how to use an E6B and that kind of thing. This is going to be more about decision making and making good planning decisions and making your flight uh, less, uh, less cumbersome and easier and just more fun. So uh, if, you're, or if you are, are a student pilot and you're working on some cross countries, uh, go ahead and put it in the flight in the, uh, put your name in the chat box here. Tell us about what you're doing. Maybe we can give you a shout out. Uh, we're simulcasting on both Facebook, YouTube, and our own uh, uh, custom site, onlinegroundschool.com slash live. So if you have any streaming problems on any of those uh, venues, feel free to go to another one. So you can come back and visit us here at onlinegroundschool.com slash live if either Facebook or YouTube is uh, being ornery today. So let us know about your flight, your flight uh, cross-country flight planning issues, questions. We are willing to take and happy to take questions. You can type them into the chat box here or give us a call at 888-514-1945. So Diana, Vincent, Donald, uh, Dan, appreciate you guys checking in. We're looking at... Uh, Glad to see everybody here. Uh, Vincent says he's uh, got a check ride coming on June 22nd. Okay, well, that's coming right on up, so I hope we'll be able to give you some pointers today that'll help you out. You might also want to go look at our YouTube channel, uh, Vincent. We've got a couple of mock check ride uh, videos on there that actually are done with a real examiner and a real candidate, although the check ride oral was a simulation. It'd be good things for you to check out. Todd, hey, uh, got a lot of people coming in here. So, Bruce, hey, Jared. Okay, so let's talk about what's involved with cross-country flight. I think pretty much everybody understands that it requires that you touch tires to pavement at least 50 miles away from where you launched. Uh, FAR 61.93, we don't want to dig into these numbers too much, but let's talk about just real quickly what the regulations say, particularly if you're a private pilot student trying to get some of these cross-countries knocked out uh, as per the regulations. So 6193 says uh, that you use aeronautical charts for VFR na navigation using pilotage and dead reckoning with the aid of a magnetic compass. Okay, pretty plain brown wrapper. Uh, use of aircraft performance charts pertaining to cross-country flight. We're going to talk about those too. And procurement and analysis of aeronautical weather reports and forecasts. So these are really some of the things that we're going to be jumping in on. Uh, one of the things that we'll be talking about with our guest is whether or not to use paper or uh, the proverbial magenta line for your cross countries. And we're going to be talking about some of that. Before we dig in, though, I want to go ahead and get queued up a T-shirt giveaway. Now, we've got a really cool set of T-shirts that we printed up for Sun and Fun. We've got cases of them. We want to give some out. We want to start giving one out to you today. So we're going to show, there's a picture of the T-shirt. They've got a big sign on the back that says, watch for low-flying aircraft. And they're always good. They're attention getters and always good for some laughs. And we like to send you one. Uh, I will mention this is to U.S. addresses only. Uh, keep it simple for us so we don't have to deal with uh, oddball shipping. So in the country, we'd be glad to send you one. All right, now here is the airplane I want you to look at. Look at this airplane image. There it is. Beautiful airplane, by the way. Uh, I want you to tell me what kind of airplane this is. Now, don't put it into the uh, chat box. I want you to call 888-514-1945, option three. Pick option three. Tell us what that airplane is, and you will win one of these cool Watch for Low Flying Aircraft t-shirts. All right, let's go ahead and move along. I'd like to introduce my uh, co-conspirator today. It's Akshay uh, Par uh, Par Gosh, Akshay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher your last name. Um, I'll let you correct me on that. Odd, because he and I have been working together for the last couple of years, but I always still mess it up. Akshay, pronounce the last name, please. Pindarker. Akshay Pindarker. Pindarker. I knew that. You got it, Russ. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thanks. It was just the heat of the 
moment, you know, setting in. Uh, Akshay is a, uh, is a Georgia Tech, uh, he's got a master's in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech, but he's also the CFI and chief flight instructor at the Georgia Tech Flying Club. Now, uh, Akshay, just tell a little, a little bit about the Flying Club so people can know your background. You operate out of PDK, right? Sure, Russ. Yeah, we uh, operate out of PDK, and uh, currently we're the oldest collegiate flying club that's in existence. We started uh, 75 years ago, uh, so this is actually our 75th anniversary this year, and uh, we started in 1945 with a few uh, World War II pilots that came back from the war, and uh, they had a steerman, and that's kind of how the club formed, and we're still going strong today. Gotcha. Yeah, my dad did, did was a was a pilot, and he did his initial training in a steerman. So you guys have a series, have a have a group, uh, a number of one seventy twos. Some outfitted better than others. Let's take a look at some of uh, your fleet there, and just tell us about some of the airplanes that you've got. All right. So this picture is a little bit dated, but essentially that's our paint scheme. Five uh, GT, which you see in the front, is our flagship of the fleet. It is a 2004 172SP, and it has, um, you know, all the fancy avionics that you could ever want. It's got two G5s, a Garmin Autopilot, a GTN 750 Navigator, which is a touchscreen GPS, and essentially it has more capabilities than some of the commercial airliners that are out there today. Um, the next airplane is no longer with us, 271. It's currently replaced by 161, but it looks the same. Um, and that's another cross-country airplane of ours. And then the last two airplanes are two of our trainers, our primary trainers. Uh, they have a 160 horsepower engine, which is a little bit less than um, the two advanced trainers that we have. Uh, but we use those primarily, uh, primarily for uh, private pilot training. Okay, good. And you also use the Gold Seal Ground School. I know you've got a pri private branded version of that. Your flight, your uh, your flight club has a lot of people in it. So we, I do know that you run a lot of students to the. Roughly, how many students does uh, Georgia Tech have? The flight club. Uh, right now, we probably have about thirty active students. Usually, we'll have about forty. Um, but with the whole pandemic going on, everyone's kind of gone home. Uh, but we're still fairly active with, with around 25 to 30 actively training members. And then actively flying, we usually stay at around 70 actively flying members uh, per school semester. Okay, good. Well, now one of those airplanes, I'm not, I, I don't remember which one it was, but you and I did some flight training for the... Uh, I hate the term, the quote unquote impossible term. You and I were doing some flight testing on some glides and some did some math with that. So uh, you do have nice airplanes and uh, you and I will be working on those some more once we get uh, some better weather and <laughs> better virus issues around yeah. here. I believe we have had a caller. Somebody wants to take a te uh, uh, guess at that aircraft. Let's take a real quick look at the airplane again and then let's okay. bring in the caller. Uh, who, who do we have? Hello, this is Russ. Hi, uh, yeah, how are you? Calling from Puerto Rico. Uh, it's a X. They're calling from Puerto Rico. Okay. Yeah. It is absolutely a North American X-15. Good for you. We need to have a. We need to put a clap track in here, <laughs> guys. We have to remember that. Good job. That is absolutely absolutely an X-15. Uh, the fastest uh, manned. Uh, experimental airplane ever built. So good job for you, uh, Jorge. We will. Uh, okay. What we'd like for you to do is send us an email. Uh, send us an okay. email to prize at onlinegroundschool.com. I'll give it to you again, an email to prize at onlinegroundschool.com. Give, your, your, give us your mailing address and your size, and we will be honored to send you one of these cool T-shirts. And thanks for identifying that aircraft. Okay. We couldn't figure out what it was, so it was very, I very appreciate you doing it. Thank you very much. Okay, Jorge, thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we've got a number of people here that says, let's see, uh, uh, several people, Fernando, uh, Dalton, uh, a lot of these people in here getting ready for cross country. So this Akshay should be a pretty good uh, session today. Uh, let's you and I, Akshay, let's talk, let me hand this over to you because you're really current with this stuff. Let's review some of the dual cross country uh, flight and training requirements so that people 
in the private pilot uh, pipeline can make sure they have all their bases covered. All right, so for private pilot uh, cross-country requirements, uh, you need to do some dual cross-country training with your instructor, which includes three hours of cross-country flying. And uh, with that three hours, you also need to do one night cross-country, um, which uh, it's, you know it needs to be a total of 100 nautical miles. So a 50 nautical mile cross-country uh, out to somewhere and back will um, satisfy that requirement. So there's not a lot of dual requirement that you need to do. Uh, the solo requirement is actually a little bit more. You need five hours of solo cross-country time. And part of that solo cross-country time will include your long uh, 150 nautical mile three airport solo flight, which is quite a big task. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's pretty much the basics of it. Uh, and students uh, can figure on multiple flights for this. It's uh multiple flights and possibly airports ne they've never been to any comments about that yeah um, hey, short you know, long cross countries uh the uh short cross countries long cross countries whatever you do you know the planning is the same essentially uh it just you might need to add a fuel stop if it's slightly longer or not but the way i do the cross countries is i'll just have uh, we'll go to interesting airports either in the mountains or by a lake or, or you know going through some kind of complex airspace just to keep it interesting and to keep the planning realistic um and then on their solo cross countries i like to send my students to airports they've never been to so we're not repeating anything uh once you've been to an airport you know how to get there you know what you're looking for it becomes very easy to go back out there and come back home again so to spice things up i uh and to keep it slightly challenging i give uh, all my students different places to go to for the first time Gotcha. And it's kind of like the written test. You really don't learn anything if you're uh, just regurgitating things from rote memorization. So I'm a fan, too, of students going off to airports that are, uh, <clears throat> are within their uh, range and capability, but spe uh, specifically airports that they've never been to. Uh, we've got one question here. I want to just jump out and grab this before we get too far um, into these other things. Uh, John Ansley uh, he is from the UK, and he is asking about how to deal with car ice in flight uh, per, or, or en route. Uh, pretty much doesn't matter where you are if you're in the air, car, car ice is car ice. And the solution to that is the application of carb heat. Uh, if you do have some carburetor icing, you can expect to see some, uh, hear some further uh, degradation, both in the sound of the engine and possibly an RPM. Uh, as the ice melts and is ingested into the fuel mixture, but that's basically it. Uh, look at your POH. Um, many of them say do not use partial carb heat, only use full carb heat, but it's whatever your POH or flight manual says. So, uh, John, I hope that answered that question. It's brief, but uh, I don't think we really needed to dig into that one too much. Use carb heat. And uh, it does happen. My 182, for example, gets a lot of carb icing. Uh, even in the summer sometimes if I'm up, you know, eight or 9,000 feet. Okay, Akshay, let's continue on with our planning. And let's talk about electronic versus paper. The uh, FAR, you know, the original 61.93 specified that these uh, cross countries for a private pilot's, uh, uh, you know, for the check ride requirements have to be done piloted as dead reckoning. So, what, is our, what are our issues between electronic versus paper? Everybody wants to do it with an iPad and follow a magenta line. What do you think about that? Yeah, so with my thought process, um, the iPads are really easy to use, or any kind of tablet, any software is fairly easy to use. So with all of my guys, I try to keep it paper only. Um, that's essentially starting with the fundamentals. You learn how to do it the old school method looking at a chart, looking on the ground, finding your point and flying to that point. There's very little room for error and it's a lot simpler actually um, to use um, because there are a lot less things to go wrong. So starting with paper, knowing how to uh, draw out the line, use a nav log, look outside, fly by looking outside, you're building those fundamental skills to which you can then transfer 
to something electronic. It's very easy to then after that pick up an iPad or a tablet, get some software, uh, navigation software, and learn how to use that. And you will always have those fundamental skills at that point. Yeah, having the fundamental skills is really important because complacency can set in. If all you've ever done is followed a GPS direct to line uh, on a piece of glass panel or, a, or an iPad, you really don't have many other fallback uh, options if that's your only skill. So I think that's a good reason that people should start out uh, even if they're not physically using paper, at least don't use that, follow that GPS purple line, you know, get out there and do the, the figuring and fly it with, uh, with a compass and a heading indicator. Uh, now, what about check rides? Uh, students might find that some DPEs have a different view of it than others. Some may allow use of an iPad or a Garmin 430 on the panel. Others may not allow such a thing. They may want us to uh, want the student to continue to do it all on paper. So do you have any uh, suggestions on how students might work with a DPE in advance? Uh, should, they give a, should they talk to the DPE before their check ride and find out what his expectations are? Absolutely. So before doing your check ride, maybe even a month out, if you know who you're going to fly with, or if you're looking at two, you know, a few DPEs, give them a call and talk to them, see what their expectations are. And based on that, you can plan and prepare for that check ride. Some guys might want just paper uh, charts, paper nav logs. Some guys might let you use an iPad, but, you know, put own ship off. So essentially you're not having any GPS capabilities with your iPad. And some guys might even let you use your iPad with uh, the GPS capabilities so that you can track a um, track your line or track a course. So depending on what the DPE wants, you'll now know. You have that information, you have that knowledge, you have the power to prepare for that specific check ride. And if you are using tablets or uh, if, if you're using any kind of electronic flight bag, always a good idea to back it up with either another EFB, electronic flight bag, or paper charts. That's right, and I've had this discussion with a number of examiners, and some have said that on the check ride, they'll let you use an iPad for your cross country, but you better have something as a backup. So my question to them was, well, what if, you're, what if you have a second iPad? And while well, some have said, no, I want to see somebody do this by hand, and others have said, no, if you've got a second iPad and you think that's going to work and everything, Expect to, use, expect to use it on your check ride. So it's a great idea to call the examiner and have this discussion what their expectations are before you uh, appear for that practical test. I hope you guys enjoyed those, those airplane videos we were showing, a bit of an, uh, an audio uh, anomaly going on there, excuse me, ver uh, video, but they were fun to look at anyway, so I hope you enjoyed those. Uh, Akshay, we have made up, uh, you and I, a sample cross country from a Peace Treaty Cab, PDK, to Dalton, Georgia, Delta, November, November. Uh, let's put that, put that route up there and let's talk about what we did to pick these waypoints. So we've got the full route over on the left side of the screen and then we've kind of blown it up on the right hand side of the screen showing the first part of the route. And we've got our first waypoints A, B, and C. So why don't you talk about these starting with uh, waypoint A, that uh, private airstrip. All right, so with waypoint A, um, that's a little bit tricky, right? It might look like a good point to pick when you're doing your cross-country planning. It's an airport, it must be easy to see. Uh, but with private strips, that is not always the case. And especially in an area like Georgia, um, it's going to be extremely difficult to see. You're gonna have trees all around it. It's, it might be just a 2,000 foot strip, um, that's grass, which will look like, you know, any small field. So A is actually not a very good point to pick. Uh, going over to B, that is crossing Highway 575. Um, and that's a very, uh, that'll be very easy to spot from the air. And then C, we've got a dam and we've also got the, um, uh, what, what was that? Let's see. We've got a dam over there and a small lake on uh, checkpoint C. And we've also got that power line. Uh, now power lines, at least in this area in Georgia, are really easy to see because you've got a nice clear cutout 
in the trees. So they're very, it's very likely that you'll spot it and uh, they go out pretty far. So crossing over that will be, um, that's a good point to pick. Gotcha. Now let's take a let's take a close up. We we head out there for just a second. Let's take a close up look at checkpoint B because, in my opinion, that is a particularly good one. We've got we've got an interstate highway. We've got a power line easement that crosses it right there at our spot. We've got a, a lake off to the left that we can use for reference. Would you say that that is one of the better ones that uh, people might uh, aspire to? Yeah, there are a lot of things to pick out over there. So you know exactly where you're going to be because you have multiple things to spot out in, in that area. You've got, like you said, you've got the road, you've got the lake, you've got the power line. Um, it, yeah, that's a good point to pick. Yeah, so the, 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 the selection of, of waypoints is pretty good. Let's go ahead and look at the second part of the route. Uh, this would be the, uh, the last half of it. And there we've got uh, waypoints D and E. Let's discuss those, why those were good or bad or indifferent. All right. So with D, again, you've got that road and power line. Uh, like I said, at least in this area, power lines are very easy to spot. So you can't really miss that. And then on E, you've got Carter's Lake to the right, and you've got an airport, David, CZL, to your left. So, again, another good point to pick. And then from there, really, you should be, if it's a nice clear day, you should be able to see Dalton from uh, waypoint E going forward. So all of those waypoints then that you picked were reasonably good with the exception of that first one. Uh, he didn't have his name, SMF 1226. <laughs> uh, yeah. The musician formerly known as SMF 1226 asked what would be a good checkpoint for A then? Uh, we're not really looking back at the chart, uh, but we would have to find something. Uh, there is, uh, there's 285 out there, which is a big uh, expressway. And we'd have to look at that. There more are a closer, bunch of but A. Yeah, go ahead. There, there are, are a bunch other of airports options. over there. Yeah, there. You know, you could probably use McCollum off of your left wing uh, for the first waypoint. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, now, as far as doing uh, figuring distance and time, there's the electronic ways to do it. There's some manual ways that we're going to talk about. Let's take a look at a four flight and see how we just a real simple way we can calculate distance on four flight. Uh, it's the, basically you put up your virtual plotter right there and with four flight, you can spread your fingers and you can draw any, draw it out and get any plotter distance that you need. Now, when you're doing your initial flight plan, of course, you're going to already have your waypoints, the distance between the waypoints calculated. But in the case of a diversion, this in four flight is an excellent tool. If you were, for example, going to have to go instead of to Dalton to that airport off to the left, I apologize. I can't read it in my prompter from here. But uh, this is the way, spread out your plotter there in four flight, and there you can see exactly how far away and take a rough estimate on what that compass heading is. Now, there's another thing. I call this the rule of thumb. This is uh, left over from the days long before we had uh, EF, uh, EFBs and four flight and the like. Uh, but literally, if you take your thumb and you hold it to the scale at the top of a chart, you will find some crease with your thumb bent that lines up with 10 nautical miles. So just make a note which one of those creases that is. And now at any time, assuming that you're looking at a full scale chart, you can just walk your thumb across and get 10, 20, 30, 35 nautical miles very easily. It doesn't have to be exact, especially when you're doing diversions. Just being able to do something quick and dirty that's pretty close gets you turned at least in the right direction and gives you some rough idea on how long that's going to take. Uh, let's do a um, let's do a, a mathematical one. Let's put this mathematical formula up here. People generally don't like math, and I have been skewered before for even suggesting this to people. Let's say they've got all this electronics. That's why they did that, so they didn't have to do math. But I want you guys to look at this one up here. It's how to estimate uh, ETE, estimated time en route. It's basically uh, 60 times the ground speed times the nautical miles that you have to go. So it's very easy. So uh, I can't remember if we had one allow viewers to calculate the answer. 
Uh, okay, yeah, using these figures, using these facts here, here's our givens. Your ground speed's 110 knots. You need to go 30 nautical miles. Just get out your calculator and real quickly jot that down on a piece of paper. And then let's uh, see what you come up with. And in just a second, we will show you that very difficult mathematical result that we uh, were able to compute. Amazing. But anyway, having some quick and dirty math functions that you can do on a piece of paper or possibly even in your head, there's some great ones for, for figuring crosswind components, for example. Having some of these available to you is just another tool that's absolutely worthwhile having in your, in your pilot toolkit in your head. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how this worked out at ETE. What was the estimated time en route using these numbers? And the answer is 16.4 minutes. That's some pretty simple eighth grade math right there, maybe even seventh grade. So not a difficult formula to remember. Maybe that one will be worth writing down and maybe committing to memory. Okay, let me take a real quick look over here. Yep, a JT said 14 to 15 minutes. Very good. Uh, would top of climb be a good first waypoint? We are going to talk about top of climb. So Vincent, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, let's see, Anton said 13 minutes. Uh, Paul has asked about an E6B versus a CX3. Honestly, I can't tell you the exact difference. This one I have, for example, is not really an E6B either. It's a CSG8A. So I suspect that generally speaking, at least for private pilot style calculations, my guess is that there's not that much of a difference. But somebody else may look that up and be able to give us more information. So I probably couldn't give you the best answer for that. Uh, Jason is in a <clears throat> in Arizona. He's planning for his check ride on Monday, so good for you. Uh, Tyler is, uh, let's see, Fernando is getting ready for his cross country. So Akshay, let's continue moving on. Um, when we're doing heading calculations, um, we need to be able to know the difference between uh, whether we need true course or magnetic course. Now, on a chart, let's put this chart up. There are some purple dashed lines on here. Why, what are these and why do we have to know what they are? They are isogonic lines. Akshay, what, do they have to, what does that matter to anything? All right, so isogonic lines will tell you how much of magnetic variation there is in the area. So when you're looking at a chart, uh, if you just have the chart laid out on a table, going straight up is what we call true north, straight left would be true west, straight east would be true east, and straight down would be true south. However, looking at an actual globe, just going straight up to the uh, poles is not your true north or true south. Um, the magnetic poles are slightly off axis and they change over time. So we need to be able to convert between your true north or true course to an actual magnetic heading. So these lines of variation, if you add uh, you know, the, the saying is uh, west is best, east is least. So if you've got an a isogonic line that shows five degrees west, we would add that to whatever true course we calculate on the chart to get a magnetic heading or a magnetic course in our case. Yeah, JT just mentioned this on the chat box that east is least and west is best, and that's why you have to know that. And this comes into play, uh, for example, when you're trying to figure out what your cruising VFR altitude is. It's based on your magnetic course, not your true heading or true course. It's magnetic, magnetic heading. So you have to put those uh, variations into consideration. Now, over here in the east, we're lucky variations here are usually three, four, five degrees, but you go out west, they're like 16, 18, 20 degrees, so they can be vastly off. So when you're trying to figure out a magnetic uh, heading to get, a, to get a magnetic course, it can be quite a difference that variation is. So be aware of it, I isogonic lines. Uh, what about winds, uh, Akshay? Uh, winds are given in degrees true. So when we're trying to figure out our flight plan, how do we deal that considering that we want to ultimately end up with a magnetic course? Yes, so, that. well, <laughs> I did look this up right before the video. Um, so man. we plot a true course, and then with the true course, because all of the winds aloft data is given in true headings, we use the E6B or whatever tool we want, uh, E6B or electronic calculator, to get the correction uh, angle. 
and then you add the correction angle, wind correction angle, based on your true airspeed to get the uh, your uh, true heading. Now, from the true heading, you want to add or subtract any magnetic variation there is based on the isogonic lines, and from there, we add or subtract any magnetic deviation we have, which is shown on the compass card. So we're doing about four steps to go from a true course, correct that for wind correction, correct it to get a magnetic course, and then correct it again to get a magnetic heading, because essentially uh, you want something that you're able to read in the airplane. And the only thing we have in the airplane is a magnetic compass. Whether you have a directional gyro, an HSI, or some kind of electronic display, it is all still based on pure magnetic heading. So we have to do a bunch of these calculations to see what to fly in the airplane that we're in. Okay, good job. I didn't, I didn't stump you at all. Uh, you just marched right through those four steps nice and, nice and gracefully. Uh, let's see, Vincent says, thanks for, the, thanks for the ETE calculation. Good, I'm glad you like it. Uh, Nikki uh, has a comment about Dwayne. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to deal with that. That may be a phone call coming in, so we'll see about that in a moment. Uh, so distance, uh, now when you're laying out your flight plan, doing your planning on the ground, you know, days before you go, uh, do you measure with a plotter or do you measure it digitally? And I'm, uh, that's going to be an obvious question of, again, do you prefer paper or do you prefer digital? Now with digital, it could be for flight, it could be online using something like Sky Vector. What do you do yourself, not just for your students, what do you do for yourself, Akshay? So personally, I will do it electronically. I use Sky Ve a combination of Sky Vector, a combination of flightplan.com, depending on whether I'm filing VFR or IFR. Um, and uh, electronically, you get perfect distances, perfect true courses. There's no small errors you get by using a pen and pencil. Um, although my students do everything uh, on paper. But then from, from electronic, I also look at the, the paper charts and make sure that everything matches for my flight personally. Gotcha. Okay, we've had a couple of questions that uh, I think I want to drop in now because before we continue on Akshay to figuring fuel burn and cloud performance and descent planning, uh, Ted, oh Scott, you're welcome, good. Uh, Ted asks, so what are some good tips for picking waypoints in flight? Uh, excuse me, at night. Uh, obviously, we don't have the same ability. Uh, depends on where you're going. Do you have any, any comments about uh, VFR visual waypoints at night? Basically, anything with lights, I guess. Yes. So nighttime flying is um, a lot trickier when you're trying to pick VFR waypoints. If you're near a city, it's very easy. You can pick lights in the cities. You can pick buildings, but at night, what you might have to do is go airport to airport and also use VOR navigation or you know radio navigation. Um, and I, I think part of the night requirement, the night cross country requirement is to really show you that it is much more difficult to fly just using pilotage. So it's really a combination of pilotage, dead reckoning, and radio navigation that you have to use at night. Yeah, absolutely. Your visual waypoints are really no, going to be nothing more than confirmation of what you've already done electronically. If, you, if you're lucky enough to be flying to an airport that has a VOR on the field, then that makes it a whole lot easier. You just pick up the radial and you fly it inbound. Uh, Vin says, it always takes me time to find winds aloft. Am I the only one? Well, you're not, Vin. And I'll tell you, in a few minutes, we're going to be talking more about those charts. Uh, so, Akshay, let's go back to uh, fuel burn. Let's look at this uh, cruise performance chart, and let's talk about how we might use the charts out of our POH in order to, to plan for flight planning. All right. So, looking at the let's cruise drop performance. Drop the chart in your lap. Yeah. Well, you can see the pressure altitude on the leftmost column. So we need to, we'll obviously know which altitude we're flying. And you can see it goes from two to 4,000 to 6,000. So if we're flying in between, we'll have to linearly interpolate. Um, 
I don't think we need to get into that right now, but um, figure out what altitude you're flying at. And then the next column over is going to be your power setting. So what RPM are you going to be running the engine at? And based on the RPM and the temperature outside at your altitude, you can see how much percent horsepower you're going to be producing, what your true airspeed is, and what your fuel burn is. Now, this is what you'd use in the cruise section of your flight to see how much, well, how, how fast you're going to be going through the air mass and how much fuel you're, you're burning. Yeah, important stuff. You absolutely have to get these performance charts out of your manual to do, to do proper planning, don't you? Mm-hmm. And the, uh, any flight can be broken up into a, you know, a departure phase, a cruise phase, a descent and landing phase. So we have different charts for different sections of these things. Uh, let's talk about climb performance because that's one of the first things that we have to do once we get the airplane off the pavement is start climbing to our altitude. So let's look at a climb performance chart. And uh, I, I think okay, someone asked the question about this. Yeah, go ahead. Um, but this is the chart you'd use to find where your top of climb is. So uh, this one is time, fuel, and distance to climb. So you know which altitude you're starting out at, uh, which is going to be your field elevation. You know what your cruising altitude is. And so looking at the chart over here, we start off from whatever altitude we're starting off at, which is our field elevation, whatever we're climbing to, and uh, we count up from those two and see how much time it takes to get to that altitude, how much distance we cover, and how much fuel we use. So if we're going from sea level, say we're at, at the coast, going from sea level to 4,000 feet, uh, that's going to use a total of, uh, well, I think we have to add these up. Um, so it's 0.3 plus Point six or uh, wait, let me actually read this. Um, yeah, it would have been easier if we'd had a line yes. drawn across for you. Right. We don't actually have to do actually do the math. I think the point is, is this data exists and people should use these charts and tables. And especially if you're on a check ride and you're getting ready, you know, you're you're sitting across the table for an examiner explaining to him why you have planned as you have, you know, this is these are the kind of things he's going to want you to have taken into consideration, you know, how much fuel are you going to burn? How long is it going to take you to climb to your altitude? Because all of this, it's cumulative. It all checks right in, clicks down the line to your total performance, to your total capability. Um, Let's talk about top of descent. Um, this is the point where you begin your descent into the into the airport. We've got a we've got a graphic for this. Let's take a look at this. Kind of show it in a profile view. Now, the top of the descent. This is where we transition from our cruise altitude to a descent to where we want to level out. And that doesn't necessarily mean the ground. It just means how we far how far we need to get down to get to some altitude. And in most VFR cases, it would be the pattern altitude at the uh, at the uh, arrival airport. Uh, and being able to do this in it, you know, knowing how to figure this is really important. If you're up at three or four thousand feet, it might not matter. But if you're up at ten thousand five hundred feet, you need to be able to get down at a reasonably uh, at a reasonable rate and arrive at the altitude that you that you want to at the end. So there's various ways to do this. Uh, Garmin panel mount GPSs have a, a top of descent page where they will tell you uh, based on where you are. Uh, how what your descent rate needs to be to arrive to come out at a given at a specified altitude at a specified point that you put in. So this stuff exists. Uh, actually, I know you have some comments about top of descent planning. Oh yeah. So uh, with the diagram that you had up, that um, we're using a standard descent rate of 500 feet per minute. So knowing the amount of altitude we have to lose and knowing that we're going to do it at 500 feet per minute, we can then track back um, how much that, you know, how much time it takes. And knowing how much time it takes, we can figure out in terms of distance where we need to start that descent. Um, so this is something you do on the ground. This isn't something we, uh, you know, calculate and figure out in the air. But knowing that distance and picking, again, another visual waypoint or reference 
to determine where the top of descent is uh, works pretty well. And knowing the power settings and speeds that will give you that 500 feet per minute uh, descent rate is also very important. Okay, so I think to summarize, we can say that every flight, cross country or not, is should be broken up and planned in distinct phases based on you know whether you're climbing, your level, you're descending, and uh, be thinking of all of these things in advance. Uh, we're going to go into weather here first, but uh, let's see. I want to get back. I saw a comment here. Oh Lord, here it is. Here it is, right here. Let's put this one up here. Fernando has asked uh, this question about weather, and I think this is a good way to open up this particular, uh, this particular segment of our broadcast. Now I just lost it again. I think we're going to get it up here on the screen here momentarily. Uh, well, anyway, any rate, <laughs> Fernando asked if there were other ways other than checking, you know, NOTAMs, guitars. There we go. Any thoughts on doing a proper pre-flight weather briefing other than checking winds aloft, METARs, TAF, air mets, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I guess what you're saying is rather than you as an individual going out and checking all of these things individually, yes, there are other ways to do that. You can do it in a more formalized uh, fashion using uh, standard briefing tools. Uh, in the old days, I say people don't do it a lot anymore. I still do as I actually call 1-800-WX-BRIEF tell them where I am, say I'd like to speak to a briefer, I tell them where I'm going, or when I'm going to be there, what's my altitude going to be, and this person is going to walk me through all the issues. They're going to start out giving me uh, the overview weather, what they call the synoptic weather, then they're going to give me the current weather at my departure airport, en route, and my destination, and then based on my time en route, he's going to give me uh, the forecast all along the route and at my departure, at my, excuse me, at my arrival airport. Next, we're going to get winds aloft. I'm going to get NOTAMs, TFRs. So I'm going to be fed this stuff in a very formalized way. Well, if you don't want to do it on the phone, uh, Fernando, you can also go to uh, 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM. I'm not sure if there's a one in front of the website name, but I think there is. It might just be 800-WXBRIEF.COM. But at any rate, go to some, I'm sure somebody will have that in the, in the chat box here momentarily. You can go to the website and you can do it all yourself. You don't have to talk to anyone and you will get it again in the exact same order. And just remember that when you're getting one of these formalized weather briefings, you're going to get it in a specific sequence, in a specific order every time. And there's six parts to it. The first thing they're going to give you, whether you do it online or you do it with a weather briefer, you're going to get the adverse conditions. And the reasons you get this first is you may find that there's a squall line along your route of flight, which means you're not going to go at all, and therefore you don't need the rest of the briefing. So adverse briefings come first. The next thing they're going to give you is the synoptic overview, the synopsis. This is, you know, the big broad view of your section of the country about what the pressure centers are doing and any frontal activity. And then they're going to move on to the current conditions. Again, we said it's your departure airport en route and your destination airport. Uh, forecast conditions, the same thing. Departure, en route, and destination airports. So now you are starting to be built this picture of the weather in time, and it's always coming to you in the same order. The next thing you're going to get are winds aloft. They're not going to, you don't, they're not going to have to go into one of these charts with all the, the columns of numbers and interpolate things and try to figure out yourself. They're going to give it to you. They're going to give you what the winds aloft are. Finally, they're going to give you NOTAMs and TFRs, and this is very important, especially the TFRs. You need to know what these things are, temporary flight restrictions, prior to uh, flight. Now, be aware that this is an election year, a national election year. We can get what they call uh, you know, VIP TFRs pop up anywhere at any time, and you do not want to uh, encroach on one of these things. Uh, you can get in a lot of trouble for that. So those are some ways you can also get... Uh, your weather briefings through ForeFlight. Uh, Akshay, do you have any, uh, any favorite ways of getting weather briefings other than just manually going out and looking up meets at all the airports? I like using flightplan.com. Um, you can put in your departure, destination, you can put in other airports en route, and it can also give you a full nav log, completely done for you for free, uh, which gives you winds aloft, which will tell you what magnetic heading to fly based on your uh, true airspeed. 
um, and you can put in performance numbers for your airplane. Usually they'll also have in uh, a, a drop down list of certain airplanes that you can pick, which should have uh, what you're going to fly. So that does all of the hard work for you. Um, and that's what I like to use. It's also you because you need a an account with them. It is also an official approved source um, of weather briefing, and it has everything with that. Along with that, what I also use is SkyVector.com. Um, not that it's any better, but it does display things graphically better, and it just makes it easier to see where all the all the weather systems radar. Uh, you know, METAR is where all that stuff is and what it's showing. Yeah, SkyVector is real easy to work with. They've got up in the little uh, the little menu line up at the top right, they've got one of the little icons that says layers. You just click that on, you can turn off and on air meds, sig meds, TFRs, all that stuff, and they'll just drop them right on the chart for you. So SkyVector is a, is a great tool. We're going to move on into uh, the couple of weather charts here, but before we do, let me grab a couple of uh, questions and comments. Going back real quickly to where we were talking about night VFR uh, flight planning, uh, Keith had a very good uh, comment, and we're not going to get into discussion about it, but he talked about uh, using uh, airports that have pilot control lighting. You can flick the lights off and on and actually see them light up, and that might be a good way to help you find an airport that is otherwise dark and know which one it is. I will say, though, that if you're off to the side or <clears throat> excuse me, more than uh, just a few miles away, you may not be able to see that airport lighting anyway. But uh, Keith, good point. Uh, Vin asks, uh, he's talking about, he says he's seen that their tolerances, tolerances for maneuvers like slow flight or their standards for rectangular patterns, S-turns, etc. There are, these are in the ACS, so not really something to cover in this particular webinar, but we do have in the ground school section five, I believe, we have lessons for S-turns, uh, rectangular pattern, uh, turns about a point, where we took real video from the airplane and mixed it in with 3D animations. And these things are really, really cool. So I would suggest you go to section five and get a complete coverage of these ground reference maneuvers. We also have a new article called The Surprising Rectangular Turn up in the articles menu at the top of the ground school. Okay, uh, Ben asked about IFR flight planning. Uh, we have not discussed that and probably won't this time because that gets into some other issues with multiple fuel stops. So Ben, maybe we'll uh, use that for a future when we're trying to stick VFR for this one. Uh, so Gary asks, what's the distance? And this is talking about back our top of descent. What distance to the airport do you want to be at pattern altitude? What distance from the airport? I think he's saying, at what distance do you want to start your descent? I'm not sure. That's going to vary, again, depending on how high you are. The higher you are, you're going to, the earlier you're going to be before you start your descent. All right, back to one of my favorite things, weather charts. So, Akshay, we're going to look at a surface analysis chart, and let's see if we can kind of draw the, uh, draw the difference between surface analysis charts and radar charts. So, let's take a look at this chart. This will be a radar set charts. There it is. Okay, well, this is your standard from NOAA uh, surface analysis chart. A lot of people don't use these. I happen to be in love with them because they tell you so much. Uh, obviously, the blue lines with the triangles, those are cold fronts. Uh, red lines with uh, rounded circles or warm fronts uh, where the two collide and you get them backwards and alternating. That would be an occluded front. And then when one front overruns the other, uh, you have the fourth front that I've forgotten the name of. <laughs> the uh, pressure centers are shown with H's and L's. We see an L over in Southern California over there. Uh, just remember that a low pressure center turns to the left. It's counterclockwise. High pressure centers turn to the right. Well, you might say, Russ, why do I need to know that? Well, there's an excellent reason because that tells you something about the airflow. If you look at the over near, over there near Arizona where we've got a low pressure center right next to a high pressure center and there's a, a, some frontal activity there, you can guarantee that you've got the high pressure is going to be going to the right, the low pressure is going to be going to the left. You're going to get a lot of wind right between those two pressure centers driving straight off to the northwest, probably a lot of turbulence too. Stationary front. Thanks, Keith. I appreciate that. I knew somebody bailed me out. That's why we have you guys. So anyway, the service analysis chart 
very, very important chart. Now, do we have a, uh, a, radar, a radar chart? I can't remember if we have one or not. Uh, a radar chart, there we go, side by side. Uh, so on the left is, on the left, excuse me, is a radar chart, and on the right is a satellite chart. So the radar chart shows precipitation. Uh, what might, might precipitation be? Well, we've got rain, snow, hail, sleet, and virga. All right, first person to uh, tell me, we're not going to give anything away here, but somebody pop into the uh, chat box and tell, first person to tell me what virga is, we'll give you a thumbs up. So the, the radar chart shows radar, it shows precipitation only, unless it's some kind of composite chart, it does not show cloud coverage. If you want to see cloud coverage, you then have to look at a satellite chart. Now, a satellite is really just a photograph taken from space of cloud cover. Now, there's also some infrared that uh, check it in the infrared uh, spectrum, but it basically is a photograph of the cloud. So to get a full picture, uh, you have to really put the two together or look at the charts separately. And they do have composite charts that do that. Okay, Ben, good for you. Ben says, uh, Virga is rain that evaporates before it hits the ground. That is ab absolutely what it is. And Vincent came in with the same answer, uh, Keith. So you guys are on the surface are on the surface or on the ball here. Uh, let's look then at some METARs. Uh, you can get again, you can get METARs from both ForeFlight, from Sky Vector. There's a world of places you can get them. So on the left, we have a METAR shown in ForeFlight for a particular airport, and they give it to you spelled out. On the right side, we have a METAR for the same airport and shown it, uh, I believe, again, I can't see that in my monitor, but I believe that is, is uh, in the raw data. Now, that kind of brings up something. I, uh, people all the time say, well, why do we have to be able to know this raw data, METAR and TAF formatting, when we can just get the, uh, the decoded versions? Well, I can tell you from experience that once you get used to it, and it's not hard, once you get used to reading these raw data TAFs and METARs, you can read them a heck of a lot faster than you can read the plain English version. You can see exactly what you want literally in a second or two. So you will become a better pilot, I believe. You will be able to act more quickly and more efficiently if you learn to read these things in the raw format. But the decoded ones are there and we just saw it in four flight. Uh, AviationWeather.gov gives us the ability to see METARs. So here we are on aviationweather.gov. And actually, this is a website we need to talk about some more, too. So uh, this is kind of a visual showing, I uh, believe that's airport station symbols. Again, I apologize. I can't see the chart. Uh, we have METARS 03. I believe we have another METARS image that probably contrasts that. Okay, so this is basically the, the chart from before. And then we then clicked on an airport to get the METAR. So this is on aviationweather.gov. And that's where they have these, these new, um, new visual charts. Actually, you want to talk about those for a minute? They are, they are awesome. And I don't know if they get the credit that they deserve. What do you think? Yeah, they are great. Um, aviationweather.gov, I'm always on that website. Uh, whether I'm flying or not, um, I'm always looking at prog charts. I'm seeing how they develop in time or really the surface analysis chart and seeing how they develop in time in real time uh, because that really helps you get an idea of, uh, okay, if there's a high pressure here or low pressure here or front coming in, what kind of weather am I going to see? And you can match it up to what you see outside. Uh, with that chart that you just had pulled up, it's essentially a, I believe, weather depiction chart. It, it's got the little symbols um, for uh, the different colors on airports, you know, green being VFR. If it's closed up, that means it's VFR but cloud cover, and then blue meaning marginal VFR, and then uh, red meaning IFR, pink meaning low IFR, so you can get an idea of what's happening in the general area. Uh, now, recently, they've also done away with the area forecast, which is a good thing. Um, if I, I don't know if any of our viewers know what an area forecast is, but uh, it used to be a textual description of what's happening in a very large area, and it was very vague. It didn't really give, uh, unless there was complete adverse weather conditions, it didn't really give you a good idea of what the weather is going to be at a certain 
airport or a certain location that you're planning to fly at and you want a forecast for. So they've done away with that large overview and they've gone to the GFA tool, which is the graphical area forecast tool. Now with this tool, you can pick a point or an airport that may not have a published TAF um, and get uh, hour by hour weather winds for that specific area. So they've really narrowed it down and uh, made a high resolution tool to find out what the forecast is for a very specific area that you might be flying to. Yeah, and they've got sliders and buttons to where you can actually tailor the chart to exactly what you're looking at. Uh, really very useful. So yeah, I would recommend that everybody go and look at these uh, GFA uh, charts on aviationweather.gov. And I think you can suspect that in the future, you're going to start to see more of these type things showing up in written tests. Uh, Ted asks uh, when to use whether he we might prefer aviationweather.gov charts over 1-800-WXBrief.com charts. In many cases, they're probably the same because they're both, uh, well, I won't say 1-800-Brief.com is a commercial, but at any rate, I would not... I don't think that I would be in favor of one over the other. They're both going to give you the same thing. And in many cases, they're probably the same charts. Um, Owain calling for uh, checking in from Jamaica. Owain, good to hear you, buddy. I'm uh, glad to see you got here with us. Uh, so at any rate, uh, that gets us through our METARs. Uh, let me just close this thing out, Akshay, with uh, just another brief coverage of weather briefings. Uh, we've done a number of webinars where we had a real examiner in here and we had a real candidate, private pilot candidate. And so many times the, they're kind of, the candidates are probably a little bit not up to speed on getting their proper weather. Uh, I won't say when, but at some point we came across a guy who's, who basically got his, asked how he did his pre-flight weather briefing. He basically said he watched uh, weather.com or weather, the weather channel on TV and thought that was it. Wasn't even aware that there was such a thing as a formalized weather briefing. So you really want to learn how to do this. You don't want to just, as a David St. George says, don't just go out there and pick up a pocket full of METARs. Don't just go out and find the airports along the route and look for the TAF forecasts or the METARs and figure you've done it. You need to go through a more integrated process. And if you work with one of these uh, outfits, uh, like, uh, like we've discussed, it's more easy to get that. There's three type of weather briefings. Do you know what they are, Akshay? Stump Akshay, I didn't tell him about this one was coming. Oh boy. What are the three types? No, you of did not. <laughs> Uh, you've got a, uh, let's see, uh, <laughs> an outlook. You've got, oh man, I'm, go. I'm just going to look at my notes. And yeah, you've, you've stumped me. I don't know if I have. Oh, okay, outlook, outlook standard, standard and, and abbreviated. abbreviated. Yes. That's right, yeah. And the standard one is what you get most of the time. Outlook is uh, what you would get if you were going to be flying eight hours from now or tomorrow, and they will give you some degree of forecast uh, prognostication about what you might expect for tomorrow. The abbreviated briefing, now again, this doesn't happen so much because that's not something you would do online, but if you were calling a weather briefer at 1-800-WXBrief.com, or just the phone number, uh, and ask the briefer for an abbreviated brief, briefing, well, he's going to say, okay, what do you want? It's not abbreviated briefing in itself. By asking for it by name does not automatically deliver to you a specific set of information. What it means is that you're going to ask the briefer something specifically you want to know. Maybe you're getting ready to leave and you want to know if there's any, if the TFR uh, activity has changed. So could you just check the TFRs for me? Maybe you've got, you want to check some last minute uh, weather questions about some front that may be threatening. Uh, so an abbreviated briefing is your chance to talk to a human being, a human briefer, ask specific questions. It's not a full standard briefing, which again is broken down into those six sections that we talked about. Well, I think that pretty much gets us uh, wrapped up here, Akshay. Can you think of anything else that you want to, uh, that you want to go over before we close out for the day here? I don't think so. Unless anyone has any specific questions, I think we uh, hit on, you know, most of the topics that go into uh, cross-country flight planning, at least for uh, VFR or your okay. private pilot. 
Okay, well, I'll take a real quick look here. We got uh, Greg from, uh, Greg from uh, Oregon. Uh, greetings from Colorado. TFR here today at KDFW. No flight for me here. Yeah. Uh, it's probably a, 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 a VIP TFR. So anyway, folks, thank you for joining us today. Akshay, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, you and I usually uh, can always find stu fun stuff to talk about. So uh, yeah. again, if you have any more questions, you can contact me directly through groundschool.com. You can just go there to our contact page, or you can call us, call on 888-514-1945, and we'll talk airplanes. I love to do it, and I've always got uh, Akshay available to answer the questions that I can't answer. So I think that's going to wrap it up for us today, guys. Thanks for joining with us. I hope you're able to get out this week and get out in the air, or at least get out to the airport and talk about flying and maybe commit some aviation. So to every one of you, I would just like to say once again, to fly smart and show everyone that you are gold seal pilots. So long.